If we will but listen, God's created works will teach us precious lessons of obedience and trust. From the stars that in their trackless courses through space follow from age to age their appointed path, down to the minutest atom, the things of nature obey the Creator's will, and God cares for everything and sustains everything that He has created. He who upholds the unnumbered worlds throughout immensity, at the same time cares for the wants of the little brown sparrow that sings its humble song without fear. When men go forth to their daily toil, as when they engage in prayer, when they lie down at night, when they rise in the morning, when the rich man feasts in his palace, or when the poor man gathers his children about the scanty board, all are tenderly watched by the Heavenly Father. There, is, there are no, te no tears are shed that God does not notice. There is no smile that he does not mark. Steps to Christ, page 85, paragraph 4. We serve a God who pays attention to all the little things in our lives. Can you say amen? amen? I pray always for the President of the United States, but I cannot say that he's concerned with the little details of my life. But the President of the universe is concerned with the little details of our lives. Several years ago, I was in the lovely country of Namibia to give an example of God caring about the little things in your, our lives. And after preaching an uh, evangelistic series, I went to see the Namib Desert. It's the oldest desert in the world. It's in Namibia. And so I went to the place where you go and I had a guide. He in a quad bike. I was on a quad bike. First time for me. So he and I rode off into the desert. And all I saw was sand, sand, sand. I had no clue where I was going, but he did. And so we got to a certain place in the desert we were there four hours and he stopped. So I could look around. There was a nice breeze blowing and the sand is always shifting. Then I looked down, I was wearing a t-shirt and I noticed that my glasses had fallen off. Now you lose your glasses in the desert, you might as well go get another pair. But there isn't a drugstore nearby. And so I said, oh no, I lost my glasses. He said, we'll retrace our steps. And I said, retrace what steps? He said, we'll retrace our steps. Everything looks the same. So I prayed to God. I said, Father, you know, I need these glasses. You sit on a plane. You've got to fill out the immigration papers. The light isn't good. I need to see. And so we got on our bikes, and he's in front and behind. And he drove around, retracing steps I couldn't see. We came to the spot where the glasses sat on the sand. Now, there's sand blowing all the time. My recollection is not a grain of sand on the glasses. As if the glasses were saying, I've been waiting for you. Where have you been? I say that to say to you, God cares for the little things in our lives. You know, these things you buy at a drugstore, CVS, whatever, $10, 20 that's it. But it was ported to me and God preserved them. And so I was amazed at how God a God so big can take time for things so small. But he loves you, and he wants you to know that. How are you? The pastor complained that he didn't answer. Well, he didn't complain, but he observed. He didn't answer when he said, Happy Sabbath. Let me back up his observation. How are you? <laughs> you sound just as dead as you did the first time, but that's okay. It's nice to see you. <laughs> God bless you. Put a double blessing on your children. And uh, may the Lord guide you step by step until he guides you right into his kingdom. I thank my little sister for reading the scripture for me. God bless you very much. I'm always happy to see young people in the church. The Lord can work on you at 10, 11, 9, and 6 as he works on those of us in 50, 60, 70, and 80. When Jesus fed the 5,000 with five loaves and two fishes, there was a little boy who had brought his lunch. He was the only one who had food. The disciples went searching. Which means when Jesus preached, children were present. Are you with me? And so I'm glad that little boy was present. His lunch was used by Christ to feed 5,000. 
The Bible says Timothy knew the scriptures from a child. And L.O.I. tells us Timothy was still a teenager when the Apostle Paul called him to serve with him. Which means Paul saw something in that teenage boy called Timothy. He was serious, hardworking, and he was recruited to be the assistant to Paul. And so young people can be serious. I welcome those of you online, wherever you are. May the Lord bless you abundantly. I really mean that. And I hope he says something through me that will change your lives. Our subject, well, before I go into the subject, is there anyone present who's not a Seventh-day Adventist? You are here for the first time. May I see your hand? First time. You are not a Seventh-day Adventist. First time. Is there someone to the left? No? Okay. All right. Anyone for the first time? Second time. Third time. All right. I'm sure there are guests online. May the Lord bless you abundantly. Our subject for this morning, time up. What did I say? Time up. Or you may say, case closed. Either way. Before I jump into that message, it's 20 minutes after 12. I'll try to release you by one. It doesn't take God long to bless his people. Please make sure this thing is turned off so that we preserve reverence in the house of God. When I was sitting over there, I was reading a passage on this, and I accidentally pressed something, and Siri came on. Are you with me? And Siri said, what exactly are you asking? I don't know if you heard it, but I almost dropped dead from shame. And so I... Ah, you know, 20 years ago, you'd call that witchcraft, but it isn't witchcraft. It is just a technology that's advancing. That's all it is. Fifth number two, while I'm speaking, pray for me and say, Lord, what? Put your words in man's mouth. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. Ask God to put his words in my mouth. And favor number three, think as you listen. Isaiah 118, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come before you in the name of Jesus, the name of the one who said, let there be light, the name of the one who said, I am the resurrection and the life. In his name we come, dear God. If we've sinned, forgive us, Father. Grant us your grace. Grant us your spirit. Grant us understanding. Give me the words to express divine truth, Father. If I have offended you particularly, forgive me and cleanse me and empower me, I pray. I humble myself before you and ask you to use me. Bless all those listening in person and online, wherever they may be around this world. Reveal truth to them, dear God, because it is truth alone that sanctifies. In a very special way, bless the government of this country and of all other countries represented by those listening. Grant them wisdom, dear God, that the decisions they make may allow the gospel to go forward. Bless the sick, heal them, dear God, remove COVID-19 from anyone who has contracted it. Now, dear God, take full control, I pray, in Jesus' name. Let God's people say, Amen and Amen. Go with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, we'll read from verse 1. It's a passage with which we're all familiar, but it will lay the foundation for what I have to say. To everything there's a what? A season and a time to every purpose under heaven. A time to be... And a time to, a time to plant, and a time to look up that which is planted. Yes, and it goes all the way down to eight, a time to love, a time to hate, a time for war, a time of peace. And we're familiar with that. There is a time for everything. Now, keeping this in mind, go to John chapter 2. Our subject, time up. Or case closed. John chapter 2, we read from verse 1. When you found it, say amen. And the third what? Day there was a?
feast where? In Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. Verse 3. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, what? They have no wine. Read verse 4 for me. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Come on, mine hour is not yet come. Which tells me immediately that Jesus' life was lived in a very disciplined way. There was a time for this and a time for that. And so he said, Mine hour is not yet come to time for me to do these miraculous things. Go to John 17. John 17, we'll read from verse 1. We're in John 2, now John 17. Are you there? If you have my version, you may read with me. These what? Words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said what? Father, the hour is come. Jesus said, now, the time has come for something to happen. That is, of course, for him to go and die. Because right after 17, he is in the Garden of Gethsemane in chapter 18. The hour is come. So in John 2, verse 4, he said, my hour is not yet come. In John 17, verse 1, the hour is come. Christ lived his life. Certain things happened at certain times. And when that time was over, that thing was past. We see that in the creation of the world. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And then Christ was done with that day of creation. The second day. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. And let it divide the waters from the waters. Genesis 1 verse 6. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. He worked on the first day. That's it. The time for the first day was gone. He worked on the second, that's it, that time was gone. He moved to the third, he made vegetation. Now, we serve a God who, in order that we might understand him, reveals to us that he works according to time. Go to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. Written by the Apostle Paul. One of the key books for understanding righteousness by faith. What's the other key book to understand righteousness by faith? They go together like Daniel and Revelation, Galatians and Romans. But of course, the entire Bible teaches us about righteousness by faith. Galatians chapter 4, let's read verse 4. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law. When the fullness of time was come a certain time was designated for Christ to begin his ministry his public ministry he lived the first 30 years of his life apart from the public now the time had come for him to begin his public ministry God gave the Israelites 490 years to do what they had not done in previous centuries 70 weeks are determined upon thy people it ended in 334, God left them alone as a nation and turned to the Gentiles. God gives us a certain amount of time to do certain things. If that's clear, say amen. All right, go to Genesis 6. Genesis 6, we read from verse 1. We have Genesis 6. Reading from verse 1, I can see here pages turning. All right, we read, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit, what, shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. 
Yet his days shall be 120 years. Now, we have to read that verse 3 microscopically. My spirit shall not always strive with man. What does that tell you immediately about the spirit striving with us? It is time limited. The word for strive in the Hebrew is most frequently translated judge. Before the flood came, while Noah was building, those who were listening and not obeying were being judged by the Spirit of God. Also being convicted, my spirit shall not always strive. There will come an end to his striving, his convicting, his judging. And when that end comes, there is no additional time given. I feel compelled to say that again. If God gives you 10 years to do something and you do not do it in 10, he doesn't give you 10 more. He may find someone else and give that person 10 years. Which means that, that we might understand God functions within the context of probation. Probation means you have a certain amount of time, if you put on probation by the courts, you have a certain amount of time to behave yourself. If you slip up, you go back to the big house. Are you following me? But if you behave yourself for that period of probation, five years, then you're off and you're free to do whatever you want. That's legal. God functions by probation and so he tells us in Genesis 6 verse 3 my spirit shall not always strive with man for that he also is flesh yet his day shall be a hundred and twenty years God gave the antediluvians one hundred and twenty years to repent repent of what look at verse 5 of Genesis 6 our subject time up or case closed and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually and it repented the law that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. God, in a certain sense, regretted having made humanity. Sin was so widespread. Don't you think God feels the same way now? Because the world is worse. It's worse. God gave them a hundred and twenty years. Go to 1 Peter chapter 3. Subject, time up. 1 Peter 3. We read from 18. Are you there? 1 Peter 3 verse 18. Not yet. Let me give you probation. Five seconds to find it. Then <laughs> I have to move on. Okay, do you have it now? First Peter 3. Let me pray again. Fathers, I continue to represent you. Help me by an infusion of your spirit, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might do what? Bring us to? Yes, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened how? By the Spirit by which also he went and did what preached unto the spirits where in prison now some people have clever ways to interpret that that's simply referring to those before the flood the spirit was god's agent to convict them as i said earlier by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison now read verse 20 what is that saying which sometime were disobedient what does sometime mean for a period of time they were resisting god which sometime were disobedient. Keep reading. When? Once the long suffering of God, come on, waited in the days of Noah. Keep reading. While the ark was a preparing. Now, the verse is simply saying the Spirit of God was moving through Noah's preaching and the preaching of Methuselah upon the hearts of those antediluvians. While the ark was going on, Noah was also preaching. Methuselah was preaching. Those holy men alive in the days of Noah were preaching. They were instruments of...
God's probationary mercy in that God spoke through them to warn the world a flood is coming if they do not change. This is probation. It lasted a hundred and twenty years. Now the Bible tells us that Noah was six hundred years when the flood came. If he preached for 120 years, he began preaching when he was 480. And baptized nobody. But he did his work. Are you with me? He did his work. Because the Bible says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness. The whole world will never be converted. As someone said earlier, most people will not be saved. But it must reach everyone so that everyone has a chance to say yes or no to Christ. 120 years Noah preached. Now go to chapter 7 of the book of Genesis. Chapter 7 of the book of Genesis. Let's see something. Verse 16. you have that now I want you to read that very carefully very microscopically Genesis 7 verse 16 start reading what does that say and they that went in went in male and female uh-huh of all flesh as God had commanded him and ah the Lord shut him in Noah did not close the door of that ark you see the ark while it was a literal uh, structure, it also had symbolic significance. The ark represents salvation. Noah's message, the gospel. The antediluvians, those who resist. Noah's family, those who accept. The Bible says the Lord shut him in. And Noah could not open the door of that ark. But I want you to think with me. Here's a door. When you go to sleep at night, do you lock your doors? And where are you? Inside. Who do you try to lock out? The thieves. And perhaps some relatives. The thieves. <laughs> are you with me? You try to keep them out. So you are on one side of the door and the undesirables are on the other. What I'm trying to say is when God closed that door, Noah was locked in and the hard-hearted sinners were locked out and neither neither of the two situations could change Noah was locked in to be saved the hard-hearted and the Luvians were locked out come on to be destroyed who locked that door God who closes probation God let me be very direct God does not send you an email to tell you when your probation closes. Go to 1 Samuel 16. It's 25 minutes to 1. I'll try to release you by 1, but we'll see what happens. You have 1 Samuel. Samuel was the first great prophet but he had two useless sons I mean spectacularly useless first Samuel 16 verse 14 read with you now what does that say and the spirit come on of the Lord departed from Saul keep reading and evil spirit uh-huh now let me clarify and keep God away from false accusation an evil spirit from the Lord simply means God allowed. Evil spirits don't inhabit the presence of God. Are you following me? You sure? God does not. The presence of God is not where evil spirits live. That's what they avoid. That's why Adam, when he sinned, he and Eve avoided God. Or the verse is saying, God simply allowed. You see, there are no voids or vacuums in nature both physically and spiritually if God withdraws his spirit another spirit occupies that space let me say it differently 
We know that God will withdraw His Spirit from the earth. That is what will bring a tremendous time of trouble no one can understand or explain. When God does that, Satan takes full control of the earth. And we will see chaos we could not now imagine. God withdrew His Spirit from Saul. And Satan took over. Now, evil spirit troubled him. Saul remained on the throne for quite a while after God had withdrawn his spirit. Are you following me? Because he kept pursuing David. You know, David spent seven years as a king without yet sitting on the throne. He was running for his life and Saul was on the throne. What am I trying to say? Saul's probation was closed. But he still sat on the throne. Now, without any intention to terrify or scare you, there are people sitting in churches whose probations have already closed because of constant resistance to the work of God's Spirit. But the force of habit keeps them coming to church. And when the time of trouble breaks, they will do the proper thing and leave and will become the most vicious enemies against those, against those who remain faithful. Let me say it again. Those who were once in the church, who once walked in truth, and who defect from God, will become the most vicious in attacking God's people in the time of trouble. There are those in churches whose probations have already closed, but I do not know who they are. Paul, Saul sat on the throne to be occupied by David, and the Spirit of God had already left him. Because God gives us a certain amount of time. Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 2. You have 2 Peter chapter 2, our subject, time up. Or case closed. Second Peter chapter 2, let's read verse 4. And in that chapter, Peter is simply saying, if God judged angels and judged the, 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 the Noahic world, he certainly judged false prophets in Peter's time. Verse 4 of Second Peter 2, read with him. What does that say? For if God spared not the angels that sinned, come on, but cast them down to, and delivered them into chains of, to be reserved unto, now what do you understand by to be reserved unto judgment? They've already been judged. But there's the judgment where a decision is made, and there's the judgment where it is executed, which is destruction by fire. Now, how can the angels in heaven, listen to me carefully, were still on probation. That's why some could fall. When God shut the door of the ark, could Noah get out? No. Could the sinners get in? No. Once your probation has closed, if you're on the righteous side, he that is righteous, come on, let him be righteous still. If you're on the unholy side, he that is filthy, come on, let him be filthy still. Someone whose probation has closed on the side of righteousness cannot be lost. Are you, what? Are you following me? Someone whose probation has been closed on the side of sin cannot be saved. The angels in heaven were still on probation. That's why some of them fell. God didn't cause them to fall. They fell. Now, listen to this quotation. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 53, paragraph 1. What did I say? Patriarchs and Prophets, page 53, Paragraph 1, listen very carefully as I continue, time up or case closed. Like the angels, the dwellers in Eden, who were they? Adam and Eve. Like the angels, the dwellers in Eden had been placed on probation. Their happy estate could be retained only on condition of fidelity to the Creator's law. They could obey and live or disobey and perish. Why was Adam cast out of the garden? Because he was still on probation. And he failed the probationary period and God had to put him. Had Adam remained 
faithful, God would have sealed him in his perfection and there would have been no sin on the earth. Let me say it again. God gave Adam and Eve a period of probation to demonstrate they wanted to live a sinless life. They failed. They were put out. Then God sent Christ to give the world that would proceed from Adam and Eve a probation. Now, go to Genesis 3. Genesis 3. Let's read verse 6 onward. What's our subject? Time up or case closed. Do you have Genesis 3? We read from verse 6. Father in heaven, continue, I pray, to speak clearly through me. In Jesus' name, amen. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. Now, in what condition was Adam when he was speaking these words? It begins with an L, ends with a T, it has only four letters. He was lost. I have good news, but for now, he was lost. What did Jesus tell Zacchaeus? The Son of Man is come to do what? Seek, come on. And to save, come on. When did that lost condition begin? With Adam. Christ is a lamb slain from the fount. So when did he begin seeking? In Eden. Why does he seek? To save. Who alone needs to be saved? Those who are lost. Adam and Eve in the aprons of leaves were lost. Christ came to seek them and to save them. So when he said, Adam, where art thou? That is the seeking process. When he placed the coats of skins on them in verse 21, that's the act of salvation, justification by faith, covered in the robes of Christ's righteousness. He sought them and he saved them because he only seeks those who are lost. Because those that are whole need not a physician, but those that are sick. Are you following me? What is, why didn't Adam die immediately when he sinned? Because Christ, by his role as Savior, extended a period of probation for Adam and for all his descendants, that includes you and me. The cross of Christ provides probation and salvation. Let me explain it my favorite way so far. If you live in a big city, you know they condemn houses. There are no condemned houses in Spokane. There must be at least one condemned house somewhere in Spokane. I live close to Detroit. There are condemned houses all over Detroit. There are condemned houses in New York. There are condemned houses in San Francisco. Wherever you have a large city, you are guaranteed they are condemned. Now, why is it condemned? It is not fit for what? Ah, it is not fit for human, it's fit for bats and rats. It is not fit, come on, for human habitation. If that's clear, say amen. A condemned house is unsafe. When Adam sinned, because the whole world had been placed under his dominion, the whole world became what? A condemned house. Follow me closely. The whole world became a condemned house. What eventually happens to a condemned house? It's torn down with a wrecking ball. Are you with me? You know what a wrecking ball is? Everything knocks it down. The wrecking ball is the condemnation of the law. The soul that sinneth, come on, talk to me, it shall die. The condemned house is condemned. The next step is demolition. But someone can go to the city and say what? 
Come on, think. Can say what? I want to buy that condemned house. Now you're not with me. You're nice looking, but you're not with me. Are you with me? Say yes. All right. Someone can go to the city and say, I want to buy that condemned house. And the city will say, you can buy it, but you have a certain amount of time to fix it up. If you don't, we'll tear it down. Now, Jesus, by his sacrifice, his blood from the foundation of the world, he bought this condemned house called earth. Now he has a certain amount of time. Talk to me. To fix it up. But while there's a, a condemned house called earth, each one of us, guess my words, is a condemned house. Mm -hmm. The soul that sinneth. Now Christ wants to do what? Fix us up so we may become fit for whose habitation? His his he doesn't have an eternity to do that he gives you and me a certain amount of time to let him convert us from a condemned house fit for demons to a palace fit for the presence of the spirit of God when that time comes and we have not allowed him to make that change we come back under the condemnation of the wrecking ball which is the final destruction the city gives that buyer a certain amount of time to fix up that house so that it becomes fit for human habitation God has given this world a certain amount of time to allow Christ to fix it so that it may become fit for divine habitation and that has to apply individually. You and I were condemned houses bought by Christ. He wants to fix us up. He does more than fix, transform. So what was a shack is now a palace where divine beings can live within. But there's a probationary period of time for that to happen. I'll tell you something else. God doesn't give 10 years of probation to everybody. He may give you 10 and give you 5. And so we judge people. How has God been so merciful to him and not to me? God deals with us individually. The, the, the merchant man who went away on a long journey, he gave one servant 5 talents. He gave another 2. He gave another 1. Of the five, he required five more. He said, well done. Of the two, two more, he said, well done. God deals with us individually. Not everyone has the same probationary time. All you and I know is that we have now. To say, God, it's time for me to stop playing with you. Let's be serious. And pray what David prayed. Create in me a clean heart of God and renew a right spirit within me there is probation for individuals there is a larger probation for the world and so we read in um, uh, Genesis, uh, Revelation sorry chapter 8 verse 5 and the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth that's the end of the intercessory work of Christ that day is coming let me say it again God gave the antediluvians a hundred and twenty years to get right they failed he destroyed that world God after years of persisting with the Jews gave them 490 days to bring an end of transgression they failed he left them as a nation in AD 34 at the stoning of Stephen went to the Gentile notice I said he left them as a nation not as individuals they were no longer a favored nation now he began assembling a nation of spiritual Jews. Their probation had passed. One day, a voice will be heard from heaven. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. 
It is righteous, let him be righteous still, filthy, filthy still. When that proclamation is made in heaven, Jesus takes off his priestly garments and he puts on his kingly garments. He takes off the mitre of the high priest, which the high priest wore when officiated in Leviticus 16 verse 4, and he puts on a crown, Revelation 14 verse 14. He does not have a censer, Genesis, uh, Revelation 8 verse 5. He has a sickle, Revelation 14 14. Every time the word sickle is used in the Bible, it is connected to harvest. What is the harvest? Reap. Bring in the, the, the ripe, get rid of the old and the wasted and the rotten. This world has a probationary period. You and I don't know the, night, the time, the date, we don't. All we know is the Bible has given us signs that tell us the coming of Christ is near. My brothers and sisters, we are saved as individuals. Mind, Character, and Personality, Volume 2, page 423, paragraph 2, the servant of the Lord writes, the gospel deals with individuals. Every soul, every human being has a soul to save or to lose. Every person has an individuality distinct and separate from everyone else. He must repent, believe, obey for himself. He must be convicted, converted for himself. He must exercise his will for himself. No one can do this by proxy. Your mother can't decide that you should be saved. God hates sin. God has suffered because of sin for thousands of years, extending before Adam because sin began in heaven with Lucifer. Are you following me? Sin has caused God to suffer. Not only Jesus, sin caused the Father to suffer. And if the Father suffers and the Son suffers, the Holy Spirit suffers. And the angels suffer, seeing the heavenly family suffer. God wants to end his suffering. He has to put an end to this world. And when he sees we've had enough time, the Lord will come and will execute judgment for the first time with absolutely no what? Mercy. Let me say it again. When God says that's it, and he comes back to destroy, he will execute that judgment for the very first time without one microscopic bit of mercy. But God will only do that when he knows he's given to every one of us enough time to do what is right. But and we can see the mercy of God and Jesus in a parable Then I'll close. Go to Luke 13, we'll read from verse 6. Our subject, time up, or case closed. Luke 13, let's read from verse 6. Luke chapter 13, Luke, as I told you, was a medical doctor and a first-class historian. Luke 13, reading from verse 6, he spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought what? Why was he looking for fruit? That's the reasonable expectation. He planted a fig tree. He came looking for fruit, a very reasonable expectation, and found none. Then said he to the dress of the vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. What are the next words? Cut it down. Stop. <laughs> I've had enough of this fig tree that keeps disappointing me. Cut it down. In other words, cut off its existence. Finish that verse. Why cumbereth it, come on, the ground? It is simply occupying space, using all the nitrogen and the other nutrients in the soil. It is just occupying space that can be better used by another tree that produces fruit. There are people in society, they just use the resources of society and make no contribution to the culture. There are people in church, they use the church, make no contribution to the church. No contribution to the gospel, they just use and use and use well-dressed parasites. And so the dresser said, why is it cumbering the ground? Cut it down. 
And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this time also till I shall dig about it. This is Christ pleading now, give them a little more time. Not yet, not yet. Give them a little time. And if it bear fruit, well. And if not, then after that, thou shalt cut it down. Christ stretches probation as far as he can. But he has to come back. Because he made a promise to Abraham that his seed would inherit the earth. Are you following me? And the Bible says, these all died in faith, not having received the promises. Hebrews 11 verse 13. The Bible says God cannot lie. God made a promise to Abraham that was not fulfilled in Abraham's lifetime. But not even death can keep God from fulfilling his word. The day has to come when God raises Abraham and his descendants and finally keeps his word. In order to do that, he must destroy this earth, make a brand new one. The Lord is not willing that any should perish. And I've closed the book to let you know visually I'm ending. He is not willing that any should perish. As you sit where you sit, do you understand God wants you in his kingdom? And when I say kingdom, we have this, uh, where I'm going to heaven. Yes, it'll only last for a thousand years. Our home will be this world made brand new. That's why the Bible says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The sojourn in heaven will last only a thousand years. Here again, we have time limits. But our life on this new earth will last forever. No more probationary periods. No more time limits. You last. You live with God forever. And I realize this concept is difficult to grasp and swallow. And because we're so accustomed to things coming to an end. People are dying right now as I speak. Saved and unsaved. There's coming a time when no one will die. No hospitals. No prisons. No sickness. No guns. No bombs. No Apache helicopters. No nuclear submarines. Are you following me? No Ukraine war. No bombing of buildings and blowing up living people. All of that will be in the past. The Bible tells us in 2 Peter 3.13, in that new world wherein dwelleth righteousness. Do you want a part of that life? I want a part. Can I see your hand? I want a part. I want to be in that world so badly. But I have to let God make me fit for that world by making me live that world, that life now. Let me say that differently. We have to live now as if we're already in heaven. Say the Lord's Prayer with me. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, now carefully, thy will be done in earth. Come on. Aha. Uh -huh. When you do that, you are living a heavenly life even while you're on the earth. That's the preparation for the world to come. Thy will be done in earth, precisely how it is done in heaven. This is the preparation. So when the new world comes, we don't feel out of place. Let me ask you again. How many want to play it in God's kingdom? Can I see your hand? Stand up with me. Those of you online, respond to the call. The call is, who wants a place in God's kingdom? The call also suggests and includes, you only have a limited amount of time to make your decision. Because God does not tell you how much time you have. The Bible says today, if you will hear his voice, do what? Harden not your heart. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for probation. Had there been no probation, Adam would have died immediately. The cross of Christ, the God, gives us not only probation, but power to live the life when we come to Christ our Savior. Father in heaven, forgive us if we have trifled with our probationary period, not realizing the seriousness of the situation. While your spirit speaks to us now, dear God, we recommit our lives to you. And we want to live with the consciousness, dear God, that in a very real sense, every day is probation. Because we may die tonight, and then our probation will close. 
So we cannot say, I am 17, I have a hundred years left. We may die tonight. Let us make choices now. And while your people have their heads bowed and their eyes closed, dear God, I make this appeal to them with humility. If there's someone listening to me and the Spirit has spoken to you, and you realize you need to recommit your life to God seriously, because the direction of your life has not been what it should be. Let's say you look back over the six months of your life and you realize it has not gone upward. It has been trending downward if you honestly review the past six months of your life. And you want to say, Father, I want to be serious with you, having heard what I heard. And I want to recommit my life to you 100%. Is this someone who will make that recommitment right now? Can I see your hand? Keep your hands up. Dear God, register every uplifted hand. The hands are raised to say, Dear God, I recommit my life to you, dear Father, 100%. Is there anyone else who will make that commitment? God bless you. Anyone else? God bless you. Dear God in heaven, empower those who've made that commitment. Remind us every day, Father, that life is uncertain. In the sense, even for the believer, that we can close our eyes at any time. But the critical question, dear God, is not how much time do we have. The critical question is what will I do now? And so move upon us, God, to make that decision now. To place our lives in the hand of our Creator. Because probation will not last forever. Bless us. Sustain us. Grant us a sense of seriousness regarding the lives we live, regardless of our age. Father, save us, dear God, and our children. Until that day comes, let us live as though every day is the last day of our probation. I pray from my heart in Jesus' name. Let God's people say, Amen and Amen. Let us sing our closing hymn, number 300, Rock of Ages. Shall we stand? Rock of ages, clap for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy riven side which flowed be of sin a double cure. Cleanse me from its guilt and power, not the labor of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands could my zeal no respite know could my tears forever flow all for sin could not atone thou must save and thou alone when my pilgrimage I close Victory o'er the last of foes When I soar to worlds unknown And behold thee on thy throne Rock of ages, cleft for me Let me hide myself in thee 